Hey guys, uh, I just had an afterthought a lot of the time when I'm thinking about how we tell philosophy, how we communicate philosophy, what we think of as philosophy. I'm thinking about the way that philosophy is taught. And philosophy is obviously a study of texts. It's of a very particular kind of writing that we do uh, that's very reflective. I just, I don't know if we're teaching philosophy in the right way if we're including enough things that uh, we could consider philosophy. And this has obviously been a topic on my mind for, for over a year. I just, I really don't know where to even begin because I, I just, I have this intuition ever since I've kind of gotten through a semester of my degree, I've been thinking like, okay, I'm reading a lot of this literature that's in a very particular fashion, that's told from a very particular perspective, namely the perspective of the philosopher who's writing. But I don't know whether that's really all-encompassing um, category, uh, what we call as like philosophy or the canon. In any case, the canon in all kinds of subjects is very um, mysterious, and it's like, why is this the canon, especially with like literary subjects as opposed to, or like artistic subjects as opposed to uh, scientific subjects, because in science you understand why something is canon. It's canon because it makes sense, it works, and it, it like holds true. Whereas in philosophy, in literature, in history, in art, in music, you can really question why something is considered uh, more important or more significant than another thing. Uh, and I realized that having read like the Tao of Nature, Tao Te Ching, and really wanting to explore more Eastern philosophy, I am really questioning in terms of Western philosophy why, you know, the people that we study, a lot of the men that we study that have like had certain thoughts and written them in certain ways, why their writing has been more successful than another piece of writing. Especially, especially when I think about like T.S. Eliot. <laughs> this is always the example I'm going to come back to because I really think he's just such a genius, but T.S. Eliot is a wonderful, wonderful poet and he's written a lot of poetry and a lot of it is actually considered very philosophical. T.S. Eliot has also in his lifetime written um, philosophy, has, has actually written and tried to contribute to philosophical discourse in his time. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have philosophical discourse in the way we've had it. I think a lot of philosophical texts are contributing to like philosophical discourse and kind of conversations between different philosophers. But I don't think that the best way to kind of make a point in philosophy is necessarily to write a treatise, like in the same way that Sartre wrote Being in Nothingness, that Hume wrote a, an essay concerning human understanding, like, and even Plato who wrote dialogues and, and a bunch of ancient philosophers who wrote dialogues. Yes, these are wonderful resources and they are furthering philosophy in a lot of ways or trying to at least, um, I think in a lot of ways, the continental approach, the the poetic approach can be so useful. Uh, it can be useful in trying to bridge these ambiguities by not explicitly trying to define them, but by having people read between the lines, having people come to their own understanding, having people interpret. I think interpretation is such a big part of it, like Ophelia mentioned in Ophelia Bear, I'll link her channel down below, you've probably heard of her a million times on my channel, but uh, she talks a little bit about history and how she likes using like literary sources in her uh, historical research and I think that that's so essential, like you can't possibly talk about history without talking about the history of everything and you can't possibly talk about philosophy without talking about the things that philosophy not only has impacted but has, has found its way into even though it's not necessarily the most pure or refined format. So film, film is like such an interesting philosophical format. Plays are such an interesting philosophical format because especially plays because they're so ephemeral, uh, because they're so uh, temporary, because they exist and then they no longer exist, but then there's like a version of them that exists in the text, but that's not the, the, the 
the truth of the play is not the text it's the it's the performance it's the experience of, of witnessing it and being a part of it almost and I think that can do a lot you know that can that can serve a lot of philosophical purposes if we kind of get into it and I think in the same way poetry a spoken word or written down either form of poetry can really tease out a lot of philosophical questions and philosophical ambiguities especially because philosophy is the unknown I feel like it's much more true to philosophy to not treat it like a scientific paper like not to try to obviously definitions are really important and like the categories that we make for ourselves in philosophy can help us understand where we stand in the like pool of thought but I just don't know if that's the best way to approach it I don't know if this is like a faulty way of approaching it I definitely think lots of literature can be considered philosophy and should be taught in philosophy and should be used to aid philosophical discussion because I don't just think art and literature and music are just ways of expressing philosophy or making them like comprehensible to the public I think they are forms of philosophy themselves if you have any thoughts about this please leave them down below I'd be very interested in hearing them uh, this is a longer video than I expected to make, but I've been having lots of like long form thoughts. Let me know if you don't mind these really long videos because most of the time I can talk for like 30 minutes. But yeah, thank you guys for watching and I will see you in another video.